five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Art of Move podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar. We're out here in the Canadian Rockies, still trying to find the grand unified theory of human movement, biomechanics, functional fitness, and how we are supposed to live and move inside of our bodies. I am recording this podcast in public right now. I'm at my favorite cafe in Banff. I had to be out of office, but the show must go on. What I'd love to start today's episode with is just like a little bit of a uh, back and forth about our own personal movement practices. We've been deep in the philosophy of talking about movement, movement science, the uh, philosophy of movement science. It's very heady. It's very uh, jargon rich, sort of conceptual. And one of the things that we harp on pretty regularly, one of our core messages is that ideas about movement are not movement itself. The map is not the territory. So even just chatting a little bit, I know it's still talking, it's still, uh, you know, it's still theory. But I'd love to talk about our own personal movement experiences lately and seeing if there's anything that we've noticed in terms of our own practice. I know you've been crushing it lately on Instagram with the, the, the different spiral lines that you've been working on with the different implements. What, uh, what kind of flows are you working on? I saw you using double ropes and some staff stuff, some bow staff stuff. What have you kind of learned from your practice lately? I'm just seeing way more uh, possibilities with the lines, right? And with the movement, with the ropes itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about the figure eights as I'm going and spirals. But I'm seeing more than just the basic figure eight, which is what most people do with the ropes, right? So a basic figure eight around your body, it looks cool, but it's pretty basic when you get it or when you just look at it with your hands and your arms. Mm -hmm. Now I'm starting co to combine multiple waves within the same uh, movement, okay? So it's hard to explain. You have to literally watch it. Where, where um, do you think you, uh, Where do you have a, an inner cue in terms of where you initiate a wave from? Do you think about like, okay, well, I'm planting my foot here. I feel this tension line and I'm going to like spiral and wave it from there. Or is it more intuitive and less, um, less thought out than that? It's very, very intuitive. Um, I've just been doing it for a long time. So I have the feel and the rope, feeds back at you it's telling you how well you're doing right so um i go by feel i go by intuition i put a song on i treat it like a dance um the heavier ropes is like strength training for me the lighter ropes is like speed training um it goes really well with boxing it's a rhythm based movement it's a a feel and <laughs> i can tell you exactly how i hit the next level i was camping and when i go camping i just I'm doing it for like 12 hours straight, right? And I love <laughs> moving. I have different implements everywhere. And I just go from one to the other. I'm playing sports here, volleyball, swimming, roping, bow staffing, uh, boxing, just one to the other. I love moving, right? Um, and hiking. So I observed, I picked up a acorn and I saw the middle of the acorn. And, and I kid you not, I saw the middle of the acorn. And I saw all the leaves, you know, the, I, I don't know what they're called, just like the um, I guess you can say the sections of the acorn the ridges. Yeah. Yeah. The ridges. And, and I was like, Hey, instead of just one of the ridges, I have ridges all over my body in 360. So <laughs> I, I literally spiral down here. I spiral up here and there's, uh, and it goes North, South, South, East, West, every direction you go to is a new opportunity for almost like a bubble around your body. Now it's hard for me to teach that because you kind of have to be doing it for a while the really really high level rope flow guys will know what i'm talking about but <laughs> yeah, that's where i'm at right and uh i've been using double bow staffs to do the same thing two sticks that are kind of like swords so i'm practicing swords and uh i have a sword here that i've been practicing a little bit with a singular one and um yeah basically it's that that's awesome man um have you done, have you had any like non implement breakthroughs or, or anything just like in your day to day experience as you're kind of moving? And like you said, you're hiking, for example, that's a pretty bare bones locomotive activity. Any sensations or inner cues or things that you've kind of noticed there? Or has it mostly been implement based practices? Um, it's mostly implement, but it is really about moving energy, right? So even when I'm doing the ropes, I should say I'm back chain, I'm flowing the energy through my body. So I feel my feet. I feel it go through the hips. I feel it go through the uh, core of my body. And I feel the wave of my spine going back and forth. Again, I look at the body in two kind of uh, pressure systems on either side. And um, the head over foot is really the balance point there. 
I can do any of the, let's say, you know, the go to back chain kind of exercises where you're pumping or, you know, how one of a kind fitness kind of does the, uh, on his toes and pushes back with his butt. I can mm. do that with the ropes and still get the same effect, yeah. except what I'm realizing now is even with, and this is my personal opinion, um, because I've been doing it for a while with the go to stuff with any of the stuff that you're not moving, it's only half the equation. You have to actually move the pressure through the body with motion to actually get the real effect. So you're only doing half if you're doing the uh, movements in the gym. If you're not actually moving as you're doing it, you're not practicing movement. You're mm -hmm. maybe creating space in your joints and you're, you know, you're pumping blood in there and you're um, getting some nice movement. If, if I was an office worker and I didn't move, that would be great, right? But mm -hmm. I, I feel like I need, because I'm moving properly and I'm flowing energy through my body, I need very little recode. I need very little extra work, right? So I can just start light, go hard at the end of the day, and my body feels great. I haven't had to do anything extra. And I'm always I'm always stretching. I do uh, panunculations. You know what that is? No, tell me. What's the definition it's, of a panunculation? It's basically what animals do. Your dog or your cat gets up and he does the huge stretch. Oh, yeah. uh, and then he goes. But I do that in many angles all through the day. So mm. it's not stretching for a long period of time. It's just reaching as far as I can up. Uh, you know, taking a few breaths, and then I go on and do my thing. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, it's about pressure mediation. So if I feel pressure, let's say, building up in my low back or, you know, my thoracic spine, I'll just lay on the floor on a hardwood floor and chill out for five minutes, get up, go do my thing. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. So I find that a lot of people don't have that sensation within their body where they know that the pressure is building up. It only builds up when they start to ache or it starts to become a noise in their body and they're like oh i feel tension right but then they don't know how to get rid of it the most simple thing you can do is just lay on the floor feet up chill out let your back touch the floor and i know a lot of people think you know you need a curve on your spine right mm. but there's a difference between when you're in movement when i'm in movement i want that nice lumbar curve okay but when i'm resting i want that curve on the ground almost like I'm flexing my muscle. I'd like to relax it, right? So, gotcha. yeah, that's basically where I'm at. Do you know if this is true? I heard this like ages ago that you are a little bit taller when you first wake up after in the morning. Like when you just get out of bed, you're a little bit taller because of the cartilage decompression in the spine. Is that true? Uh, apparently it is. Like I've never measured for myself, but it makes sense. Uh, at, during the day, the gravity decompre or compresses the uh, uh, discs. And mm -hmm. you dehydrate the disc a little bit throughout the day. So, you know, add on 33 discs and, uh, or whatever it is, I should know this, I'm a chiropractor, but uh, <laughs> basically you, you do lose a little bit of height and, you know, your knees have cart like a uh, water-based cartilage, hyaluronic acid and, and, uh, you know, ankles, knees, hips, they all have that mm -hmm. fluid. So it makes sense that that would be the case. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. So, so there are a few things that you said that, um, kind of remind me of the things that I've been playing with when you're talking about pressure mediation. It's basically just angling your joints and adjusting your your gravity, your center of mass, to put certain parts of your body on tension. So when we're talking about front chain versus back chain, like the back chain dominant thing is just to put your hamstrings, your glutes, uh, that connection in your outer calf. If you're on the outside of your foot, you create this line of tension, which takes pressure off and less compression on your spine and, and different other parts of your body that would otherwise have to support that load. It's just a mechanical principle, right? And one of the things that I started, you know, like my own exploration has been really heavy on has been how to feel those lines of tension in motion. Cause it's easy to like adjust a static posture. Like as I'm sitting here, I I'm leaning forward and putting my, uh, the outside fourth and fifth metatarsal into the ground to create this line of tension from the ground to my hamstring so that my back doesn't get compressed as I'm sitting and recording this, even though I'm sitting on a picnic bench at a picnic table, I'm still playing with that center of mass and that tension to create the load where I want to, because that's where I feel most supported with the least effort. And that's kind of, you know, like how, how do I feel most supported with the least effort? That's the static posture version of it. How do I basically harness the most elastic energy with the least amount of effort is how it translates to me in movement. So lately I've been biking a lot. And I've been trying to, you know, 
keep my love. Like I, I used to watch these guys on road bikes and see this hyper kyphotic lumbar and throughout like their whole, they, they look like worm Chad on, on top of a bike and they're just ripping it super, super hard. And I'm like, there's no way that's good for your back or your, or your hip flexors or anything. Right. It's, it doesn't look like it would contribute to very good posture or very good mechanics. So, you know, trying to do that same thing, trying to elongate the spine, put the hamstrings on tension, the glutes. I've never felt my hamstrings on a bicycle before, but I, you know, I just biked up to Banff this morning. I got up at 4.30 and I biked from Camor to Banff to about an hour. I biked for an hour 15 door to door. And the whole time it was just hamstrings, glutes. I've never felt hamstrings, glutes on a, on a bicycle before. I've rode bikes for like, I don't know, 20 years. And it's it's from the deliberate positioning of my joints to create tension and bias certain muscle groups and bias certain elastic stretching so that when I'm moving, you know, like I'm even on the bike, I'm I'm spiraling, I'm like I'm going side to side and using that spinal engine so that I can create more tension, elasticity, release, and I can go a lot harder with a lot less effort um, by harnessing that. Now it's interesting because even with that in mind, as I'm biking. I still notice that after I'm done a longer bike ride, I have to check in with my mechanics. I have to check in with my natural standing and locomotive mechanics because of how much my body adapted to outputting force in a seated position, which is not the same as the vertical ground forces that you have when you're running. It's not the same spiraling energy. Even if you can bias some of the same behaviors that you try to exhibit, like I'm still using spinal engine, I'm still back chain dominant, I'm still on tension in my hamstrings and glutes over my quadriceps, I'm still on that outside edge, I'm still on that fourth and fifth metatarsal, I'm doing all these things, but the, the application of force is just not the same on a bike as it is when you're running or sprinting. So you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm, and I'm trying, so I'm trying to dial in my biking as much as I can to be, to feel the same as when I'm running or I'm sprinting and I'm getting closer and closer and closer. Every time I bike, it feels better. My, my lumbar doesn't round. I have that nice, uh, rib cage to pelvis relationship. I have all those things lined up and biking is feeling better. It's feeling more effortless. I'm, you know, I'm crushing these, these distances and these bike rides with no real experience. You know, I just started a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, I'm like, super efficient at it, great control, great speed on a relatively cheap bike. So that's sort of what I've kind of been experimenting with. And, and what it, what I've really been paying attention to is lines of tension in movement and how that, it, you know, equates to some of Tom Meyer's ideas about fascial lines, right? And you know, how, how these fascial lines connect to one another and spiral across the body, create proper levels of tension and compression to create a tensegrity structure. And when you're stretching that elastic force and you're pulling on these, you know, these struts that are supported by this tension and compression, that it'll snap back into form. And that's the elastic force that you're harnessing for, for more power and stuff. So that's kind of where I've been. I've been, you know, I'm, I'm still doing a lot of uh, experimentation with go-to movements, some one of a kind fitness stuff. Um, I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm playing with the propulsors a little bit and I'm, I'm just seeing like, you know, at that last elastic snap of, of the end of my arm swing in a sprint. Like I notice, I, I film myself a lot, right? So I notice I'm throwing my arm back in a sprint. So I'll take the propulsors and I'll just give it a little in that end range and see if I can harness that snap back. See if I can have a stronger elastic snap on the upper body from the shoulders. Can I stabilize the shoulders in a dynamic way? And I'm doing the whole movement, but I'm, I'm, I'm isolating the snap in the shoulders with a propulsor. That's something I've been playing with a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of where I'm at. I, I think it's a, it's a pretty. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's very interesting what you just said there, right? Like you're playing with the arm snapback, and uh, you know, there's there's the argument that these things should become natural, right? Like you shouldn't have to think about it. But I think part of a movement practice is going in and thinking about it purposefully and having intention behind it, right? So. When I'm doing ropes, when I'm walking, running, and by the way, I forgot to mention that I always barefoot walk, uh, uh, lots of hiking in the summer. Yeah. Constantly, I'm outside. I don't go to a always. gym. Uh, always outside, right? So um, basically, I take part by part, and sometimes I'm thinking about my feet. Sometimes I'm thinking about uh, my knees, hips. Uh, what, do you, what are my hips doing? How do they feel? Uh, where, does the, where does the energy feel stuck? And what I mean by that is you know, when, it's, when I'm feeling my hip rotate from side to side what am i feeling and mm -hmm. uh i'll go five minutes there and then i'll start feeling my spine how is that waving how 
does it feel free? One of the things I've really noticed in the past, let's say a couple months, is where my tension lays as I push my hips back. So I'll get mm. to a point sometimes where I feel almost no tension in my body, but still connected. Yeah. Right. So it's a great place to be because it feels so freeing. Right. Um, I'm moving about and my body feels almost effortless uh, as I move. So it's great stuff. And I've done almost no, you know, gym work at all in, in three, four years. And my body well, seems to be working better. That, that's the tensegrity structure thing that I was kind of talking about is when you have that perfect equilibrium, it still feels like you're on tension, but not tense. It feels like you're structurally stable, but without effort. It's the, it's that perfect balance point between tension and compression. And, you know, I had, I had a friend who had a, a near religious experience when he, when he felt that for the first time, because he just was always used to having like super wide feet and leaning into one side and always like relying on some sort of external thing to have that level of stability and support. And when he experienced that tensegrity in his system, he experienced where it was like he was standing with perfect balance. His weight was perfectly centered so that it was just, you know, joint stacked on joints supporting itself. And he was just in that perfect sweet spot. And he was like, this exists. Like this feeling of equilibrium exists. This feeling of ease and effortlessness exists. Like when you're out of that, being in your body feels like a burden. Being in your body feels like you're constantly trying to lean against something to support this weight that you just always feel. And if you get that proper uh, alignment along the different lines in your system so that you have that nice balance of tension and compression, you have that nice posture, you have that nice, I think posture for the most part, um, when people make a big deal about posture, it's it's where your center of gravity is and it's how, how much you're relying on a tensegrity structure versus how much are you relying on the actual effort of maintaining you know supporting your own system so with effort. what do you mean by center of gravity how do you define it um i i feel like it's um let me let me let me see if i can explain it because it's it's a very um easily felt sensation for me can i go I first here yeah, yeah, yeah go to, for it go you for can it. pivot off that to me i don't worry about it i worry about balance where am I balanced, right? So to me, uh, if I have my hips back in the right spot, I feel the tensions uh, turn on in the back. But again, it doesn't feel like a burden. It feels nice, okay? And from there, all I have to do is balance my body. And as long as I'm head over foot, if I'm just walking normally, right? When I'm you know, cutting and running, it's a little bit different because you have to match the angle of the force. So your head go will go outside of your foot sometimes, when you're cutting sideways. But to me, it's about being in balance. Center of gravity is more of an academic term that is not applicable to me so much in actual real life, right? It's balance. So so, so it's, uh, you know, the center, like I looked up a, an actual definition. I was going to see if I could relay that to yours. The center of gravity is the average location of the weight of an object. We can completely describe the motion of any object through space in terms of the translation of the center of gravity of the object from one place to another and the rotation of the object around its center of gravity if it is free to rotate. So that's, um, you know, for me, when you're talking about balance, it just means that your center of gravity is stacked in a particular way where the natural tensions of your body allow you to be in balance. So I'm saying like I'm manipulating my center of gravity. Like you said, head over foot, for example, is a creation of a center of gravity over that foot that your head is over. It's the, it's the centering or the intentional distribution of your load, your weight, and creating, it's like the, the vortex that, that movement and, and application of force sur is, is surrounded by. Does that make sense? Well, I know, I know from biomechanics classes that they define it pretty much center of gravity for a man is at, its, at the pelvis and it's a little bit higher for females. That might be, I might be mixing those up, but basically that's what is defined as center of gravity, but they believe that the body is the straight linear mover, right? So I don't even use center of gravity because I don't care. I just want to be balanced, right? So for me, I'm going to redefine center of gravity as being in balance and uh, wherever I am, I'm going, right? So if I'm in balance at that point, I'm good to go, right? So, so would, you say, would you say instead of uh, center of gravity, would you say line of force? Like when you're talking about your head going over your foot, now you have this like diagonal line of force from your head 
uh, to your to your foot that you're trying to keep balance in. Does that does that kind of make more sense? Like if you think of like a line of force from your head to your foot, and wherever like if you have, uh, you know, like if you're standing posture, for example, you have your two feet like at uh, a fist width apart, and you have your column centered right, and you have that straight line down in between those two columns. You, you have that perfect equal distribution. That's that's a line. That's a line of force, right? And so we're talking about like lines of force being dictated to be optimally like centered so that you're in balance. That's kind of how I'm visualizing what you're talking about and putting it together with, with different ideas that I've heard. Um, yeah, I, I guess you can say that, but it, to me, it's really a difference between the academic language and the actual application because I can, I can turn myself to the side and I can go, the weight is balanced. If, if I look from the side, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm just standing there, the weight is distributed around my pelvis, right? So that would be the center of gravity academically. However, in real life, I'm actually moving, so my center of gravity is changing slightly as I move, so I can't really define where it is uh, in a still image. I have to go head over foot, and I have to be balanced in order to uh, move. So there's a difference between an organic structure and an inorganic structure that I just took take a picture of, right? So yes, the line of force will be higher if I have my head over and I'm in my columns, as Gota would say. I can apply more force to the ground, right? And academically, if you define my center of gravity at my pelvis, if I lean over a little bit, it might change there, mm. right? Like in the academic sense. But I, again, I don't really care. I just want to be in balance, right? So um, I want to be in balance and I want a next move. That's really the application part of it. Mm. I don't know. Maybe uh, I'll have to think about this one a little bit more and really uh, come back with a better answer. Yeah, because, you know, like I think of like the average distribution of the weight of someone when it's in motion, for example, there's a moment where your foot hits the floor where your your whole weight gets like funneled and concentrated there. And that's where I visualize the center of gravity in motion, right? It's like, where is where is that line of force most distributed? And how is that line of force transferring? Does that make sense? So when I'm talking about what the you're saying now, force, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And that's kind of like the green dot uh, laser um, you know, go to and whack, say, you know, from the fourth and fifth metatarsal, it's a green line coming up. I guess you can look at that as the center of gravity, um, at that exact moment. Right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, in, in terms of force application now, in terms of actual academic end of it, I don't know if that would be the case. I think, I still think it would stay within the pelvis and for a female in the, uh, belly button area. Is that because like the or opposite? It, well, it's funny because because that would that would be like um, that would line up with the brace the core model pretty good because it's almost like that center of gravity is like sending forces out and like that that's still the the center that people are considering forces applying from. Exactly, that is yeah. the it has to be that way because um, the spine is a, a rigid structure in the academic sense, right? Like, where have you seen the side bend be? Uh, kind of acknowledged within academics i don't see it right so i think i, I think they're starting to say it but i don't think it's in the textbooks and when it comes time to calculate forces it's not there so no i, I haven't i haven't heard anything about it yet either so um yeah i mean i haven't looked very hard for it either which is uh is something that uh I, I have to confess too, like just in the spirit of like, I haven't looked super hard at academic literature to see if they're talking about side pens, you know, or like, or, or any of the things that, that, but generally speaking, when you have someone who is academically minded, the, the narrative tends to fall towards more of a brace the core model that I, I've noticed anyway. I don't hear. Well, I have been looking and I haven't found it. Um, <laughs> it is, it, it is a rigid lever system for the most part, um, side view for the most part. Front side, mm. back side mechanics, force velocity curves, um, how much force can you put in the ground, um, yeah. that sort of thing. It's not a, it, it, it's a lever system versus a pressure wave, an energy mover versus a lever system. Okay. Mm. So um, the new biomechanics that were kind of in the niche, it's all about pressure, uh, sorry, uh, energy movement. And to me, pressure mediation. And that's where a lot of the PRI guys fall, like uh, Bill Hartman, and I don't know if he's a PRI guy, Connor Harris, PRI. They do talk a lot about pressure mediation. I love that about it, right? I'd love to get a PRI guy on to uh, to say something about that. But um, 
I'm actually uh, yeah, again, I'm pressure mediation to someone right now who has like a lot of experience with both Gota and PRI, and we'll, we'll try to get her on. Um, this is actually a pretty cool segue into a comment that you sent me that you wanted to to answer. Um, there was a guy, Gabe Masson, who commented. What did he comment on exactly? Was that was that on my post? That was on the post. Uh, the Lance Brooks uh, debate. So when he challenged, so when you yeah, so when you challenged him to to a debate. This was, this was one of the replies that we got. Um, I'm not aware of the specifics of the interactions, but as an overall scientific principle, the unscientific step comes when one party takes a position where there are not enough data to create a consensus, and he maintains his position as true because there is not enough evidence slash research. This is unscientific. You still take a position based on lack of information. In such a case, the only scientific way to go is to remain agnostic to the question, just saying we don't know at this precise moment in time based on the available literature. Then subsequently adding your own subjective experience to justify your position will also be scientific, but only if you remain open to either new evidence contrary to your experience or through debating your experience and or already public evidence. As an example, Stanley Plotkin's vaccine theories, Big Daddy, was caught to say in a deposition a couple years back that according to the safety studies of vaccines, there were no evidence showing any causal links between vaccines and autism. What he failed to recognize is that there are just not enough studies done to prove the contrary either. So the entire medical field has made an unscientific decision by saying that lack of causal... Sorry, one second. La I, I just we it was on to uh, lack of causal link between vaccines and autism. What he failed to realize. Da, 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 sorry. So the entire medical field has made an unscientific decision by saying that lack of causal link proven is equal to no causal link, which is false. They don't know because they don't do the studies. Meaning proper studies within with inert placebos or regarding long-term health outcomes comparing fully versus non-vaccinated children, and now anecdotal and independent research argues otherwise. This is preposterous. If you don't engage in more studies, debates, or are transparent that your position is subjective when there is lack of evidence, you are acting out of fear and in an unscientific manner. Whether about vaccines or posture, the scientific method is an iteration process and iteration process is the same. So that guy should debate or say he's okay with partial truth he has at hand and isn't interested to perfect his knowledge. It's very interesting. Can you pull it up? Do you have it? Yeah, I'll pull it up right here. One second. Right. Because uh, it's long, so I gotta have to go part by part there. Yeah, we'll go part by part. Yeah. So first section, I'm not aware of specifics of the interactions, but as an overall scientific principle, the unscientific step comes when one party takes a position when there is not enough data to create a consensus and he maintains his position as true because there is not enough evidence slash research. This is unscientific. You still take a position based on lack of information. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that completely. I agree with it partially, right? Um, when one party takes a position when there's not enough data to create a consensus, why do you need a consensus? You know, like, uh, I, I get, I get the consensus in science with peer review and, and, uh, scientific field, but where in the scientific method. So we're talking about scientific method or, or I am versus the actual scientific field right now, right? They love consensus. Now the scientific field, but there was never a consensus, uh, element to it in the scientific method okay so as to me i'm going back to are you following the scientific method when you're claiming something okay right. did you actually go through the scientific process and can i analyze where you took your observations and how you conducted your research and psychologically why did you choose that research and that position in the first place why did you choose to study that in the first place do you get what I'm saying about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, yeah. So, like, w w I think the word consensus is interesting because it it it's sort of alludes to this idea that we're agreeing on what reality is. It, we have to agree that the data means what the data means, and oftentimes that's what we don't. First of all, we have to agree on what data is relevant. We have to agree on, you know, what what questions are worth asking, and the questions that we ask are based on the models that we ascribe to. But beyond just having to agree on that, we have to agree on what the data and the outcomes mean. 
um, because there is there is meaning behind there are implications behind and, and people will filter the implications again based on their current models of reality and limitations of perception so consensus is you know something that is important because as a society as a species we have agreements and we have consensus on you know what words mean as i'm speaking you have different understandings you could you know if you've ever seen the movie uh, waking life have you ever no. seen that, that movie? Oh, it's, it's an incredible movie. The whole thing is about a guy who's, uh, you know, he's, he's stuck in a dream and a dream and a dream. And in every one of these dreams that he wakes up into, he has this existential philosophical conversation with someone. And in one of these conversations that this guy has in one of his dreams, this woman is sitting here and she says, you know, I could say the word love and those sound waves will you know, resonate on your eardrums and they will send electrical signals into your brain to let you know that you registered this sound, but then it'll go through this Byzantine conduit of your brain and basically measure the, that word and that those sound and that data against all your past experiences of love or lack of love. And you have a whole story about it that is completely unique from mine. So how do I know that you know what I'm talking about when I say the word love? It's it's interesting because we have this consensus, but at the same time, like we have consensus about what word mean, words mean. And, you know, every English speaker could listen to me and have a different interpretation of what I'm saying, but they wouldn't disagree that the words mean, you know, different things than what's in the dictionary, for example. Um, it's, it's consensus is important, but at the same time, the subjective nature of interpretation of data is a universal because that's what human beings are subjective meaning creating animals you know so that's well, just what i'm thinking there right now the consensus is uh, the truth according to uh you know academic institutions right but um we're proposing a new paradigm here and and a lot of other people are it's not just us right so um i think i like popper's view where can you falsify? Can you falsify this? Right. And mm. if you can take any theory and you can repeat the experiment, I, I don't find a problem with that. If, if somebody wants to do an experiment to try to disprove gravity, go for it. You probably won't succeed. Right. But I'm, I'm saying that that's okay. Right. But I think mm. today's uh, view is we've, we already know things, so let's move on. Right. But that's not how paradigms change. And that's not where we're at right now. Right. And I don't think, to be honest, from my view in our field, I don't see the information being very good. It's not very solid. Right. Uh, so and why, why is that? What, what makes it lackluster in your mind? The variables just aren't accounted for. Right. So right. Uh, it, it's really circular reasoning. We'll take the uh, again, brace the core model where the center of gravity is. Right. Like. Why is that being studied constantly when in observation, we're seeing something different? We're seeing the pressure wave. So here's the, the difference. I've heard, well, maybe well, there is a pressure you wave. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see the pressure wave if you're observing it and you're not looking for it. it exactly, right? Which is what's happening right now, right? Like there is a SMU video where you can see head over foot happening in the 3D model, but they don't have to acknowledge it because it's not within the institution to understand that yet right or to even look at it so they're not going to do studies on it therefore it doesn't exist but i can take that data if i wanted to do research and i can be like look there's an alternative model here here's the observational proof okay so here's another difference this field isn't claiming to be scientific where the scientists are claiming to be scientific right so uh we're not being unscientific here, but at the same time, we don't have uh, research to back up the claims in the traditional way of having a consensus. And you can only participate if you're already in the field. So the experts are the only participants currently in the moment to have official science. Okay, well, so can, can we agree? Can we? Can you and I have a consensus for the sake of this discussion that yeah. being scientific means to apply the scientific method? as a an exercise in in you know rigorous critical thinking it's like if you want to be scientific then you form a hypothesis you go through the whole scientific method about your theory and that's and, how you are scientific uh, i i would love that if that was the case then that opens up a whole bunch of doors right to to new paradigm that would open up the doors to a new paradigm if every let's say every phd 
in biomechanics and in, in the movement and nutrition and health field would take that position that let's do a new audit. Let's see where the research, the current research right now, let's stop research for two years and let's audit what we've done before. Okay. And let's audit to see if it went through the scientific process. Because right now, in my opinion, what I see is big data is coming in and they're just reifying their models. The models are, uh, they're taking their old models and then not looking at other data coming in. And, and guys like Goda came in and said, look, we're observing things that aren't in the literature right now. Where does this fit in? Oh, we could just ignore it because it's not in the research, right? So I would propose as a smart idea, which is probably not going to ever happen or not going to happen, I would love to see it happen, is to stop research and audit your previous research to see if it actually went through the scientific method and to see if you can put new observations in the actual uh, theory and in the actual, um, what's it called, uh, into the actual, uh, um, into the actual experiment. Mm. Okay. I'm going to see if those experiments that were done in the past followed the scientific method, or did I just look at a previous, uh, experiment and then deduce from there that that is the only way to do it. Hmm. So let's, let's move on to the next section here. In such a case, the only scientific way to go is to remain agnostic to the question, just saying we don't know at this precise moment in time based on the available literature. And just off the top of my head here, um, that's, that's the approach I kind of take is like, I don't like, I'm having an experience that feels like it relates to some of the, the theories and the explanations that I've had, but I actually don't have enough data myself to like, I know the experience as the experience, but I don't know the experience as something quantified yet. And when I say I'm agnostic to certain functional fitness and certain, um, biomechanical principles, it's that, you know, just cause I have a felt experience doesn't necessarily mean that I know why I have that felt experience or, or what the implications of that felt experience are. And that's, that's where I don't mind saying I'm agnostic. I search for data and I use terminology that might not necessarily be scientifically validated to explain my experience because it does a better job of some of the models that uh, some of the academic research provides. And that's ultimately what that means for me. So, you know, saying, I don't think there's a problem with remaining agnostic, but I also don't think that there's anything wrong with, um, with, you know, saying that it's like, no, but, I, but I still have this observation, you know, it's like, you might not have to assert it as an ultimate truth, but you can still assert it as relevant as something worth discussing, you know? Well, on the ground right now, the problem is, and, and the problem that, I, I suspect is there is that the observations aren't matching the current uh, literature, right? So mm. um, we're almost looking at the observations and critiquing them so that they can go into an, an experiment. However, to get them into the experiment, that is where it starts entering the current scientific uh, consensus slash institutions. And they don't want to take those observations because they will go against the current models, which is why I said we need an audit, right? So um, to me, that's where we're at. We're actually pre, like we're before the actual uh, research or before the actual experiment. We're seeing observations that don't match and saying, hey, put these in your experiments. And it's just not happening, right? And because that's not happening, they can just ignore it. But you can't really ignore it because people on social media are seeing it over and over and over again. And, uh, and it's becoming one of those questions, who is the expert here, right? So um, I'm going to make an accusation that a lot of the scientific, uh, you know, the PhDs and the uh, experts can ignore this or feel like they can ignore it because they are the expert. Who are you to say these things because you don't have these credentials? And that's the way it works. And a lot of people say, of course, that's how it should work. What do you mean? I went to school for like 10 years. And by the way, I did go to school for like eight or nine years and I have credentials, but in order for me to even participate in the scientific field, I would have to enter the research field and then good luck getting published because you're an outcast, right? So there's a, a whole social end that mm. isn't really accounted for, almost like it's per they pretend that it's not there, that they're above the social aspect of 
what happens when you're in a group and groupthink, right? So to me, that's scientism. You won't allow new information in that is like elephant in the room information where mm. these are observable uh, these are observable patterns that you can see over and over and over again and it's just being ignored. However, who's the expert now, right? Who's yeah. the expert? Uh, and, and that's a real question, right? Should the public be able to question experts, right? That is the kind of like the underlying political aspect of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So, of course, experts are going to be like, no, you shouldn't because you don't know what you're doing because you think you know what you're doing, but you're Dunning-Kruger yourself, right? Like, uh, you think you know more than you do, but you don't. I have all these labs and, and all that, but uh, it takes people from the kind of the inside, which... I, I would say I'm semi on the inside. I've never done a formal research, but I'm very well learned within the academic uh, consensus that I know and I've experienced that that is the social attitude towards it. Okay, so uh, guys, let in some new observations and see what happens. I would propose if you're a researcher, stop your research, go back and see what you're missing and a new paradigm would come about where, in my opinion, where um, there would be a lot more fruit coming afterwards. So what are some examples of variables that people could include and things to include in their observations and their tests? Things, you know, like, like when I'm thinking about it, it's like, what about lateral and rotational forces when you're, you know, exploring force distribution is a force plate adequate to measure the rotational or spiraling or, or lateral forces that happen. Um, are you going to consider the you know, fascial tension as part of the forces that you're measuring? Like what are, what are some other variables or factors that you think people could start adding into testing, the, you know, the old, like basically how can we put the old model up to the test? What are the, what are the variables that we need to focus on here? Well, I mean, there's, there's many, right? So let's just pick one. And let's pick uh, uh, connective tissue, fascia. Right now, mm -hmm. it, like the consensus is that tendons transfer force, which is true, right? However, what are those tendons connected to? Those are you. You can't separate the tendon from the fascia that and connective tissue that comes into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the the model now is muscle into tendon into bone, right? But it really doesn't work that way. It's it's a blend of everything, right? But that doesn't work well with mathematical models. And the thing is, they want numbers, quali or quantitative measures, where I'm saying, what about the qualitative? Because we're human beings. Why are you throwing out the quality because of the measurement you want, right? So you're choosing a quali or quantitative measure because you believe that's what science should be. But who said that, mm. right? Who said that? Um, we're... We need to, in my opinion, we need to bring back the qualitative aspect of science and and art and blend it together, right? But that's not mm. a place that it, they want to separate it even more into big data. P-values are massive. Did we hit this arbitrary P-value, right? So you can hit a P-value by just uh, letting go of the data that you don't want, right? So there's obvious elephants in the room with uh, even big data and and data and again they want to go farther into data and less into quality okay mm. so that's one aspect of it but again i would love guys like lance brooks uh no bullshit physio and and uh the whole like scientific uh physio world and chiral world to acknowledge or or to say that that doesn't happen that tendons don't go into fascia and the fascia doesn't transfer the force into the tendon because they'll admit the tendon going into the bone. They'll admit mm. it's going into the muscle. And that's the, that is what we learned at school. Okay. And uh, my school wasn't the only one. Trust me. It was everybody. Okay. Now, again, the tendon goes into the connective tissue. The connective tissue has the force that's it, it's applying through Ross and Bereznik is an easy, uh, paper. I can't remember the, the year I'll, I'll pull it up next time, but basically they're moving the muscle. They're like, hey, what's actually stretching is the fascia. What's going on here? Yeah, uh, of course, right? That is actually what's transferring the force. Now, they talk about the muscle acting isometrically. So the muscle's contracting, transferring the force into the fascia, which transfers it into the tendon, okay? But it all happens kind of at once. It's one unit, 
and it's going into the bone. So even there, I separated it, but in reality, you can't really separate separate it. Mm. And in application, if I throw a hook with my punch, boom, right? Where is that uh, separation happening? They're like uh, peck into uh, shoulder, which contracts and goes, er, you know, like this, like a mm. robot. So again, we have to go back to the observations that you actually make and they don't match. So it's, it's a weird scenario to be in right now because why don't you just admit it? It's, <laughs> it, it's <laughs> observable, right? We can admit the observation or I, I'm asserting that an observation is happening, that there's mm. rotary spiral motions and there's force transfer through the fascia into the, connect, into the tendons, which go into the bone if you want to separate it, which I don't, but let's do it for now. And that's actually the force is going through. Mm. Okay. So that's your assertion. And that's what you're saying. It's like, feel free to debate me on this. Yes. Um, and also why aren't you accounting for that? So, yeah, and, and that. try to deny that. I would love for someone to deny that. Deny I mean, that. you sent me that clip where, uh, you know, Lance Brooks basically did, uh, I guess, secondhandedly deny that where, you know, and then, and then proceeded to refute his own claim, like not even a minute and a half later. Right. So you said, did you want to pull up that clip? Did you want to play that clip? I could play that clip. Let's go to Tom Myers. Let's let's pivot off this because that's a long a sentence, and I don't want to get into uh, the jabs because we'll probably get mm. censored on the on YouTube. So uh, let's get away from that for a minute um, mm. and go into the. I want to play a Tom Myers clip where he talks about what he actually thinks, and this is actually pivoting off of um, who was it that said it? Was it No Bullshit Physio? Who, made a post about tom myers anatomy lines right yeah yeah he was he was saying that the anatomy i can, I can pull it up in a, in a second here but but keep going yeah so he so basically the tom myers makes a claim that there's actual lines through your body that you can uh dissect that transfer force through the body in certain directions and i think his rules from what i know from his 2012 text he may have updated since then i haven't really looked at his work all that much, I should say way more than average, but I haven't looked at it at all because he's got a lot of work, right? Um, it, it was basically like his rules are with fascia, if he calls it a train, an anatomy train, which means the lines of tension through your body, through right. the fascia is actually connected, it has to go in the same direction. It can't take a turn. So that's where he does his cuts, right? So again, a lot of the guys are like, he's just arbitrarily cutting with his knife. He doesn't make that claim, right? So I'd love to see a debate I can't debate that point because I'm not Tom Myers, right? And I actually don't use the lines myself so much. I look at the angles of the joints and I look what makes sense. And I look at the body as a uh, energy mover, as a pressure wave now, as a, uh, you have, uh, as a chain of motions, okay? That, and I go with what makes sense according to uh, the movement, right? Applying, you know, all the things that I said before, we'll just say... Um, Anyway, going back to the Tom Myers lines, um, I think uh, one study, I haven't looked at it yet, and I will look at it. It's basically saying that some of them pan out and some of them don't. And the uh, opposing claim is that since fascia is everywhere, then it's worked with whatever you're doing anyway. So you can do whatever you want and it'll still be worked. However, that's not the claim Tom Myers is making. I can't refute it and I can't support it because I haven't actually dissected it that way and that's another thing right i have done more cadaver anatomy than probably any of these guys right so three years total of cadaver anatomy we weren't instructed to take the fat like to actually look at the fascia you're instructed to cut through the fascia and look at the muscles so mm -hmm. the muscle origin and insertion and it's basically that right so where are the where is it inserting where is it going to lever system and that's that right so how would you know if You've never done it. And I'm, I'm not saying I've done more anatomy than most people. And I never did it because that just wasn't a thing back then. Right. So Tom Myers is making claims that he has this. Yeah. So, so I pulled up that no bullshit physio post and yeah. he's referencing a study. Wilka et al 2016 sought to answer this question of whether or not myofascial chains exist. By reviewing relevant human anatomical dissection studies, they looked for evidence of a link between the structures that are supposed to be connected together by the fascial lines, popularized by Thomas Myers' anatomy trains. These lines 
our links are referred to as transitions. And so they went through all the, the transitions that um, Tom Myers explained in his book, Anatomy Trains. And so some of them they found, so the ones that seem to have the most anatomical evidence of were the superficial back line, the back functional line, and the front functional line. Um, weak evidence was the lateral line, both sides, the spiral line had five out of nine that they, that they were able to, to validate two out of five for that lateral line. And then, uh, the superficial front line, they didn't find anything. And then there's no research basically, or not enough actual evidence or research to say anything about the, the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 different uh, fascial lines basically that Tom Myers describes, but at least three of them have decent evidence and two of them have like moderate evidence, but seem to be different than he describes them. It doesn't say for me that that's, that's like, okay, so myofascial, you know, fascial lines do exist. They can be observed anatomically. They've been validated scientifically. I, it, it just also seems like there is a massive amount of data missing for you to actually draw anything relevant from that information. I, yeah, exactly. Um, again, I don't know exactly how Tom Myers does his dissections. I've watched a few, but uh, again, mm -hmm. like uh, maybe he's being arbitrary. I don't know. But also in this paper, I'd have to take a look at the paper individually. And that's what I do now. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. there's a good paper. I'm not going to just take your word for it. I'm going to have to go look because every time I, <laughs> there's so many times where they're like, take a look at this paper, debunks this. And I look at it, it's like, that is not even close to a debunk. It's right. A, it's actually a, a terrible yeah. paper and it's conducted poorly. Right. So I'll look at it, each individual paper. I haven't looked at this one, so I can't give it a fair shake, but is the person or is the person skilled to be able to copy what Tom Myers is doing? Right. Are the, are, do they have the same skill? Was Tom Myers present to, to see it? I, I would love to see in studies like this where it's possible to film it. I would love to see an open source film of you doing it, right? Um, why not? It's 2022, put your iPhone up, right? And uh, film yourself doing it. Why not, right? So if you can be as open as you can with the research that you're doing and there's no legal barriers to it, why not put it open source so that in the spirit of science, in the spirit of science, you can replicate the study perfectly. Right. So I don't know if Tom Myers is doing that. I'm pretty sure he does have a lot of series of dissections that you can yeah, pay for. His multiple on multiple site. dissection videos and, and series and, and things that he demonstrates his ideas with in live. I would love to live. I would love to get him on the podcast to ask him this stuff, right? So maybe yes. we should we should we'll ask try. him. But um let's let's play a video of Tom Myers and what he's saying here about uh uh tense or let's let's play a video about the actual anatomy lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can pivot off that and see, see what we think. Right. I'm going to do that right now. And you might Sorry. have to unmute it too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what is going on. So there's in the bottom right, you can unmute it and then, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll start it from the beginning. Okay. I'm going to start it all over again and, uh, crank, crank that volume too, if you can, I will try to. So I kind of played it fast there, but basically he's talking about the spiral line and he's showing it on a skeleton. And this is Jill Miller's podcast, who's good friends with Kelly Starrett, and she's a yoga tune-up. Her brand is called Yoga Tune-Up. And uh, yeah, they're going through the spiral line and you can already see that uh, they're talking about yoga. And to me, like I, I'm already in disagreement that I, I don't think yoga is the best application for fascia in that... I like bounce with fascia. That's how I do my 80, 20, right? So, uh, we're already in kind of disagreement there and let's see what he's saying about the actual lines. Have a look here and see how the spiral line spirals around the trunk. Now we're going to take that up first and then we're going to take up this jump rope that goes under the foot. 
and back up to the hip in such a way as to, as I say, make a jump rope under the foot and support the arches and hook the arches up to the back of your head. It's really kind of cool the way it is. And now just keep turning to your left. It goes around, around, around to here. Okay, now you get to stop, but now turn around to the front. So you see in the back how it's coming across to the ribs and then from the ribs across the belly down to the hip in front. Anything you're noticing here yet, Anthony? It's a spiral. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a spiral. It's a spiral but, uh, he's making some big claims here, right? He's like saying yeah. it's continuous all the way from the foot and back up under the arch up to the head, yeah, right? Like so it loops itself around. I can see why people are kind of suspicious about that. It's like, are you serious? I learned levers. I learned bicep Ooh. curl, you know, like arm lever, you know, like foot lever. Flexing like we're still talking in levers and this guy's spiraling around the whole body, right? So let's see what else he's saying here. So I'm just going to stop it here and say that I have dissected this in the actual muscle fiber, the splenius capitus that goes up to your head and the mm. rhomboid do go in the same direction. So he's accurate about this and it does continue into the serratus anterior. So it is one line in the muscular sense and I can't, well, of course the fascia is just going to be overlying it. So I would deduce that that's happening in the fascia as well. Mm. You know what I'm saying by that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. So um, I see what he's saying here. Let's see where he goes from there. So basically, he, if you're listening, he's holding a rubber band and he's going from the head to in between the scapula over underneath the armpit into the serratus and saying it's one continuous unit. Hmm. I'm going to play it again. To the serratus. Can you see that these guys would have a reciprocal relationship on the position of the scapula? So let go. When you see the scapula really protracted forward like this, you know serratus anterior is locked short, concentrically loaded, really overdoing it, and the four wrong boys are stretched out with the <laughs> Or you see somebody with a flat back, uh, usually, with a flat back, and the uh, shoulder blades even next to much. The, right in there is enough to have the wrong boys locked short, concentrically loaded, overdoing the job, and poor serratus anterior is being overstretched in my health. So, Interesting stuff, eh? Mm -hmm. So if you're, so he's basically saying here, if you're fascia, He's, he's showing arbitrary things that could happen. He's saying if your fascia is way too tight on one side, it's going to be stretched out on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say it's tight on one side, your muscle on that side is going to have to contract harder. And when it contracts harder, you know, it's going to have to work harder. Therefore, you may get some issues there, right? And you're going to have pressure there. Now, um, you know what scapular dyskinesis is? There's a huge debate over whether it matters. And that is a a physio chiropractor therapist term where uh, you put your arms over your head or you move your shoulders and, and your shoulder blade might pop out and it might not move in the, in a smooth motion. And that was a problem for a long time and a diagnosis that you can make. However, now the science based physio guys are saying, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. You're going to know SIBO somebody. Um, but uh, it's an interesting tape take of what Tom Myers is saying about it here. He's like, wait a second. It's just, it's tension on one side versus the other side. And I can see the argument for pressure mediation here. Not mm -hmm. the fact that a, your scapular dyskinesis model is different from what Tom Myers is saying here. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to continue. So the balance of the spiral line also allows a balance of a relaxed shoulder coming from the head down to here. If you want to body read this, you almost have it in the rust here, but I'll add a little red line. You draw a line from from the side of the head to the brow line, or the brow line if you're working with a guy, but anyway, around this way, and draw a similar line this way. You see it would make an X. One of those lines of the X might be longer than the other. If you have to get out your micrometer to see whether one is longer than the other, as you do in Lisa's case, then don't worry about it. It's not a big issue. But if you can see a difference in the length or the angle, sometimes when somebody has a spiral line, bit, the one that is short is more vertical. And the one that's too long or not as well toned is more oblique. So, a way to body right, read this is draw an X along the back and see mm. if there's one equal or not. 
uh, pretty interesting stuff, eh? Like that that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Where um, he just saying that if it's way egregious, like if if one side is obviously way more over to one end than the other, let's just say, or, or uneven, you might have more pressure on one side than than the other, and you the muscles on that side might have to contra- work con- uh, concentrically a little bit harder mm. or a lot harder. But if it's close to being even, don't worry about it, right? Is that a crazy position to be taking there i don't think so i don't think so well yeah, and it's it's funny because the, like you know a lot of i think functional patterns is influenced heavily by anatomy trains and by thomas meyer's ideas nadu was the first person who i ever heard talking about how people favor one spiral direction and a lot of dysfunctions actually come from you know being stuck in in one particular direction of a spiral you always spiral in the same direction you start to dehydrate the fascia in that spiral line because you're overusing that spiral line and uh, you basically, it's like you're trying to even out this spiral so that you have better tensegrity. He's the only person I've ever heard talk. He was the first person, but he was also the only person. I don't hear anyone else who's outside of FP talking about, uh, you know, equalizing spiral lines for optimal tensegrity. So uh, a personal story here is I, I came upon this work in, it, it was probably before 2012. When I was in school, probably like my second year. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is wild. Like, how do I apply this though? Right? Like, and there were so many theories on how to apply it all of a sudden everyone's like well this is twisted so that means this and this and this and i've heard andrea spina say like man I've, I've looked at everything nothing really makes sense and i tried for the longest time to make sense of it and i couldn't so i kind of threw it away right like i was like yeah there's something to it but i can't apply it to a patient um if i start messing around with you know patient comes in and i see a twist in his upper body and i'm like thinking about all these lines from head to toe I'm just going to confuse them. I'm not going to know how to to uh, fix it in general, right? Because sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. And I'm going to waste a lot of precious time and it's just not going to work, right? So I threw it away for a long time. But when I started looking at Wex's work, I started looking at Naudi's work, I started looking at Goda. I'm like, this is a, simplifies this model, right? So I'm like, you know what? Let's bring it back to uh, actually moving smoothly using uh actual like um mechanics like engineering mechanics of you know there's pressure on one side more than the other here's how you step here's how you rotate that becomes a lot easier because the fix becomes easier you don't have to go to the actual part and start messing with it Mm -hmm. you can start looking at the body as a whole and maybe zoom in on a part if you need to right so that really changes the game for me now, how Tom Myers applies it, he does a lot of yoga work. So he works with Jill Miller and he works with a lot of yoga people that, oh, your upper body's tight. Why don't you do a, I, I don't know what these are called, where you like twist to one pose. side. Yeah. What, which pose? A triangle pose. Triangle pose, right? And it's going to pull one side more than the other. Therefore, since that side's tight and you're twisting it, it's going to even itself out. Now, to me, that doesn't make sense because one, it's not in movement. And two, it's a static, right? I, I take the 80-20 of fascia and I'm bouncing and I'm, I'm doing reciprocal movements and uh, circular movements that are yeah. easy. So I can quote unquote rinse out the fascia, whatever you want to call it. I'm working that line or that line of tension. Again, I don't go with Tom Myers lines, but it's lines of tension, right? And I'm quote unquote hydrating the fascia, which again is not a crazy concept because what are you doing when you're, what, what are you doing when you're actually weightlifting? Let's say bicep curls. You're targeting the bicep. That is not a crazy concept, right? So why can't you do that with a movement? Why can't you do that the way Naudi does it, right? That, like, it works on one end in a lever system, but then they deny it in a movement context with what Naudi does, right? So it's like, because it's not a lever, they throw it out. By the way, Naudi's awesome, okay? Like, so, ma- so many straw men against Naudi. He's awesome. He was a pioneer here, took a lot of arrows, lots of love for Naudi, right? So um, anything to say about that one? No, I mean, I, I agree. Like when, when you talked about the bicep curl being just like, oh, you're applying force to a certain muscle group. And then when you're looking at a functional patterns or another person who's into rotational movement training or training outside of just, you know, the sagittal or, or frontal or even transverse planes for that matter, when you start to create spirals or you start to create complex movement patterns, you're still... Uh, you're still isolating a line 
to a degree, right? You're still like you're still creating a a, a, t a pattern of tensioning, right? Like you could say, you know, like is is a deadlift uh, a leg exercise or a back exercise or or some other exercise? Like no, not necessarily. That's that's not that's not true. Um, it's you would say it's a movement pattern that trains a lot of muscles in harmony with one another, and and you're sequencing out the firing of certain muscles and creating the appropriate tensions to withstand the external load. Well, it's the same thing with the rotational movement. It's the absolute same thing. And yes, well, I can still hear you here. Um, how's my audio on your end? Uh, it's a little bit quiet, so maybe speak up quiet. slightly, yeah. but uh, uh, be, we'll see uh, when it comes out. Yeah, it might be a cable thing, but we'll, we'll see. I'll just speak yeah. really, really close to it. For sure. But um, yeah, it's, you know, you're, you're still applying a certain uh, degree of force in a certain direction. You're still applying, um, you know, a specific line and a specific harmonization or sequence of firing of musculature. It just happens to be along these lines of tension that we have identified as fascial lines, right? So you're, you're, you're still training, but you're training in sequence. You're training as a function. You're training as a function that, that is informed by anatomical structure and, and the patterning of certain lines. And especially if those lines are validated by dissection, then like, why wouldn't you train them? Yeah, like I think the argument is a lot of them aren't. But uh, even that, uh, like I know they posted that to kind of debunk, uh, uh, not functional patterns, but uh, Tom Myers lines. Mm -hmm. But actually it kind of validates it because it doesn't, like think about what it's not saying. It's not saying that the fascia is just being worked arbitrarily. It is saying that there is, uh, even though it's only four out of 10 or whatever that are validated according to this study, it is saying that they are valid. So fascia is not being worked in general uh, when you're doing anything. There is specifics to it. And again, I have to look at that exact study. I can't comment on it anymore, but um, there is something to it. Again, I heard Stu McGill, it's, uh, you know, the butt to lat one is, is a big one that is uh, scientifically validated and... Mm -hmm an official approved line. So th these things are not complete woo woo, even in the scientific field. I love them, right? I, I use lines of force. I see what makes sense. And I try to apply that force elastically. That's the application, right? So I wanted to play another Tom Myers video where he talks about tensegrity, which is the actual key to this whole thing. And, and yeah, this, this will relate to um, what we just talked about with the fascia just being worked uh, arbitrarily and yeah. the lever system versus the uh, tensegrity system. Yeah. Okay. Do you, did you have anything to say that before? No, that? No, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play this clip and then we'll bounce a few ideas and then I got to wrap up. Sure. So. Sure. on the balance of the soft tissues of the fascia and the muscle together. It is those balance of soft tissues that holds the skeleton up in the air, not the other way. The skeleton doesn't hold the muscles up in the air, the soft tissue holds the skeleton up in the air, and the skeleton isn't the skeleton, it is a series of bones floating in the soft tissue. And there is a form of engineering that much more closely parallels the body, um, with some exceptions. So let's look at this for a minute. This is a tensegrity structure that is a portmanteau of tension and integrity. So the integrity of this structure lies in the balance of the cords, which I hope you can see on the camera, as opposed to the struts. Now the struts, they're like the bones, similar to the bones in the body, they are compression structures. They are resisting compression from this end, resisting the compression. And these guys are providing the tension from one end to the other. But none of these compression members, none of the bones, none of the struts touch each other. This thing is held in shape, and I can even shake it, and it holds its shape. I can even knock it, and it holds its shape. Not because it's one brick sitting on top of another brick, but because the cords are held in balance by these tension members. Now, that does mean that they float a bit, which means that if, I hope you can see this, that the struts are moving a bit as I change the tension on the structure. That's something really interesting that's happening. It's getting stronger and more stable. Now I can't move the struts so much because as I force it together, these tension lines get tauter, the whole structure gets stronger and more like a solid structure. So right now it's fairly loose. I can wiggle this around a lot. But when I put 
little strain on the structure. It tightens up and it won't wiggle around so much. You can see this air signaling. We are. So, uh, I'm, I'm just going to play this first part over again because it's the most important part and very interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dependent structures. Our integrity depends on the balance of the soft tissues of the fascia and the muscle together. It is those balance of soft tissues that holds the skeleton up in the air, not the other way. The skeleton doesn't hold the muscles up in the air. The soft tissue holds the skeleton up in the air. And the skeleton isn't the skeleton. It is a series of bones floating in the soft tissue. And there is a form of engineering that much more closely parallels the body and that's tensegrity uh, right mm -hmm. so how interesting is that eh? and that's from uh functional patterns uh uh actual facebook page i think right so yeah super interesting stuff and yeah the bones are floating in the soft tissue and act like struts versus a lever system where they're pulling on the bones right mm. which is almost what everybody applies it like right now right so that completely changes the game on how to apply uh, forces through your body, right? And that is the the essence of kind of where Goda and Weck and uh, Naudi have gone, right? So very interesting. And uh, anything to say about that? Well, it just seems that, you know, if you apply that model, then the goal of any functional fitness training is to create that perfect equilibrium between the soft tissues and the bones that that tension and compression that's i think ultimately the goal of functional patterns they go on a very very deep level to try and figure out what what is that optimal balance of yeah, fascial tension and of holding yourself in a particular way what what will contribute biomechanically to the most efficient and most structurally secure yet decompressed pattern because what happens is if you don't have that that balance essentially then you start dumping pressure and you start dumping things your muscles have to contract harder or compress harder in order to make up for that lack of mutual support that's making you have that floating feeling that supported floating feeling that you have yeah um again the old model is a continuous compression model right it's like this bone sits on top of this on top of this on top of this and it's continuous compression and levers where this is free floating struts and tensegrity, right? Mm. So if I take a uh, finger and I go like this and I extend it, the joint right here is going to be taut, right? And yeah. that's where I can injure the, the joint because that's the end of the line, right? But it's also going to give me the most snapback. Mm. Where the middle, it's, it's loose now. So it's a loose structure. But if I go the other way, same thing applies, right? It'll bounce back. And that is the recoil aspect of it. Okay, so the difference is between the finger and the whole body is that if you continuously move in a pressure wave, in a coil, in a rotary motion, that whole system snaps back and shares the force and continues the force up the chain, right? Yeah, it's like loading a spring. Yeah, it doesn't make sense in the actual lever model. So this is, to me, it's fairly obvious at this point that that's a way more accurate description of how the body works and how to apply it in movement. However, we're up against the old system where they don't want to let go of the levers and the anatomical models that, that have uh, preceded that, right? And the continuous compression structures. I think for, you know, a future, a few very future episode near here, we should uh, pull up that study that no bullshit physio put up about these fascial lines and actually take a look at how they deduce some of this, what, what studies they looked at, what dissections they looked at, what anatomical proof they have and, or, or don't have. And, uh, and we are going to get no bullshit physio on very, very soon, possibly with functional memology. Um, and Ricky Stanzi to, to have a debate about some of this stuff, specifically about the role of fascia and some of the, some of the patterns that we're talking about here. Um, we have some really cool questions formulated that we're just refining. And then we're also, um, trying to figure out some stuff in our own schedule. So, so stay tuned for that. What did you guys think of today's episode? Anything that you agreed with or did not agree with anything that you think we're on a roll with or, or onto something with, but are missing some information, things that you want us to cover that we haven't talked about. Um, either let us know in the comments, send me a message on Instagram at the body moves or will at the art of move. And you can definitely become a part of this conversation yourself. We record these live on no filter net 
nofilter.net, where you can actually hit the knock button and request to join the stream yourself. So if you want to be a part of these conversations, hop on with us. It's a great time. You can do it from anywhere. I'm literally sitting on a picnic table outside of a cafe with a, a Wi-Fi signal. But, you know, I've had people join in from like a 5G signal or a 4G signal on their iPhone, and it works just as good. So anyway that you want to hop in and have a conversation with us, we're always open to it. Go check us out on Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Art of Move, guys. We'll catch you on the next episode. Have a good one, guys.